Okay, Amherst Media, we're holding for production. Okay, Mr. Marshall, Amherst Media has given us the go-ahead. You have a quorum of the board at 639, and you are the co-host of this meeting. I think we're good to go. All right. Thank you, Pam. You're welcome. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of September 4th, 2024. My name is Doug Marshall, and as chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 639 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is accessible on the meeting agenda, posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda where the Zoom link is, is listed at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording transcript or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the town's website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and return to mute. Bruce Coldham. I am here. Thanks, Bruce. Fred Hartwell. I am here. Thank you. Uh, Jesse Major. I'm here. Great to see you. Um, I, Doug Marshall, am present. Johanna Newman. Here. Hello, Johanna. And Karen Winter. Here. All right. We've got everyone except our newest member who has been sworn in now by the, or appointed by town council, uh, Mr. Lawrence Klutz. Uh, we believe he will be able to join us later in the meeting, but, but it is possible that he will not make it at all. <clears throat> Board members, if technical issues arise, we may need to pause to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please, raise, please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your request and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. To the general public, the general public comment item is reserved for public comment on items not later on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting when deemed appropriate by the planning board chair. Please indicate you wish to make a comment when by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, Please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation may be disconnected from the meeting. Okay, so time now is 642 and we can start off with our first agenda item, which is minutes of our past meetings. And our packet included the minutes as drafted by Chris and Pam uh, for the meeting on June 26th of this year. So board members, any comments on these minutes? Bruce. Um, I read through and as we got to the Hunters Hill portion of the minutes, uh, Chris, I noticed there was still a question in bold parenthesis in there. 
and I think you probably didn't mean to keep that in the minutes. So, uh, and while we're in that immediately below in the sentence, I'm reported as uh, observing or noting that sound pressure levels from the generator were uh, equivalent to uh, heat uh, water heaters, heat pump water heaters, and and the minutes say that are often installed on buildings, and I, I it it should say in buildings. So it's a small change, but it actually means uh, it makes a significant difference to the relevance of the comment. Um, so I would uh, uh, the first is a question about whether you intended that to be in the minutes, and the second is just a changing a word from on to in um this first section uh the first question having to do with the condition i did leave that in the minutes because it, you did discuss that um whether it should apply to the generator or not yeah. um and then later on when we issued the con the decision um that was not in there okay so it's it was intentional i wasn't sure i just wanted to be because uh, i haven't seen minutes with uh, uh, like that but so then uh, I would uh, move or suggest that uh, or ask that the uh, record show what I think I actually said and where so, is that can you tell I think me? it's uh, I, I'm not looking at them now but I think it's in the sentence below it's it yeah, has, bottom, it, bottom of page six, six is where they uh, you talk about the generator and the heat pump decibel levels installed on a house normally installed in a house is that right yes and that's and and that's relevant because you would be much more sensitive to a, a noise that was in the house and so we're basically saying that the generator which is outside the house has a sound pressure level that's more or less equivalent to a, a, a device that's often or is not often is is in, typically installed in the house well, was this the the outside or the inside unit for the heat pumps? Uh, it was it was it was a reference to the generator, Doug. The uh, the the they we asked what. Yeah, the I noise just was. I just mean yeah. that 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 the heat pump. Maybe it should just say at the house. Yeah. So we don't have to get into whether it's inside or outside. No, no, I uh, it's it it wasn't. Uh, there's no heat pump as far as I know there. I was just uh, drawing attention to what the decibel level, the reported decibel level of the generator was. They, it was reported as being at around um, 65 dP or something like that, or maybe 60. And just for the clarification, I had said, uh, just for information, that's equivalent to a heat pump water heater, which is typically installed in a house. In a house. Oh, a heat, oh, pump, a heat water pump water, water heater? heater? Yeah. Oh, because okay. it just says heat pump. Heat pump. Yes, yeah, so it should be. A, I said a heat pump water heater uh, okay. installed in a house. Okay. That's, well, that's what I said. Now I can understand the in. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Got okay, it. Okay, so with that one uh, edit, okay, let's see. I've got with that one edit, other... you, you've you got my vote, yes. Probably yeah, well, it, let's, let, I want to let Jesse uh, comment before we get to the motion. Uh, Thank Chris, you. Uh, Go ahead, Jesse. Just a grammatical correction, not a content correction. Top of page nine. That sentence, that the very first sentence, just needs some help. Um, maybe recognizing this is the beginning of the process and the board doesn't need to be overly prescriptive. Might be a, a suggested edit. Just the sentence as written doesn't isn't quite grammatically correct. That's all. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Any and other comments? That, uh, Go ahead. With that, I'll move to accept the minutes with these two changes. Great. Thank you. Anybody want a second? Johanna, okay. you got your hand up. I'll second the motion. All right. Any further comments? All right, we'll go to the roll call. Bruce. Aye. And Fred. Aye. Jesse. Aye. Um, Johanna. Aye. Karen. Aye. I'm an aye as well. 
Six in favor, one absent. Okay, that's the end of the first item. Next item is public comment. Time is 6.48. We have 20 people in the attendees area. And I usually read what I can see from their Zoom uh, moniker, let's say. All right, so we have someone at 413-768-8508. We have Arlie, Bert Fernandez, Karina McCandless, Egbert Bacher, Elizabeth Veerling, Eric Bachrock, George Ryan, Jenny Kallick, Kathleen Bridgewater, Mark Robley, Matt Moyen, Maura Keene, Michael Lipinski, Pat DeAngelis, Paul Robinson, Paula Moore, Renee Moss, Renee Richard, Robert Bazooka, and Tom Reedy. All right, so this is the time for public comment on items not later on the agenda. So if you have a comment on the Shutesbury Road project, this is not the time to make your comment. Anything else you wanna talk about? Now is the time. So please raise your hand. I'll give everyone a few seconds to do that. If I don't see hands in the next 15 to 20 seconds, I think we'll move on. I will also add, I'm seeing that there is one phone call in listener. Maybe that's the number that I called, that I read initially. Okay, no one has raised their hand. I guess you're all here for the next item on the agenda. So we'll move on from public comment. There is no public comment uh, being asked for this evening. Time is now 6.50. Third item on the agenda. In accordance with the provisions of Mass General Law, Chapter 40A, this public hearing has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SUB 2025-01. Applicant is W.D. Coles Incorporated and it's on Shutesbury Road. Request approval for a four lot preliminary subdivision plan under Mass General Law Chapter 41, sections 81L and 81S. Located, uh, the parcels are map, uh, located on, the, on our parcel map, numbers 9B-11, 9B-12, 9D-26, and 9D-27 all located in the R-O zoning district. All right, so first, do we have any board member disclosure for this project? All right, I don't see any board members raising their hands, so I will assume nobody has any relationships with the applicant or the project that, that need to be disclosed. All right, uh, can we bring over the, the, the applicants representatives? I see Tom Reedy is already here. Tom, will anybody be joining you this evening? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Matt Moyen uh, will be joining me, please. Okay. All right, Matt's now here. Welcome, Matt. Thanks for having me. All right, so Matt or Tom, now's the time to give us your opening uh, comments. Perfect. Introduction. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the board. For the record, Tom Reedy, attorney with Bacon Wilson, out of Amherst, here on behalf of the applicant in the application for a preliminary subdivision plan uh, for uh, a four-lot subdivision on four parcels off of Shutesbury Road in Amherst. With me this evening, Matt Moyen from Tetra Tech, who's the, the site designer, the site engineer. And I think um, maybe by way of a little bit of background, and I know Ms. Brestrup, I think, did a terrific job of putting this together in a, a memo that she had provided was just to set some context of really what we're looking to do here. And it was, um, I think it's important to know that we're filing, we filed for a preliminary subdivision plan and state law allows us to go through the preliminary plan process and then follow up from the date of that initial preliminary plan filing within seven months with a definitive subdivision plan. And then if the endorsed, approved and endorsed on that definitive subdivision plan, to then have the zoning that was in effect at the time of the filing of the preliminary plan frozen for a period of eight years. And so, you know, quite candidly, we're not looking to build a residential subdivision here. We're just looking to freeze zoning. And there's a process freeze, which is what we're in now from the filing of that preliminary plan. And then there is that uh, eight year freeze from the time of the endorsement of that definitive plan. And so I don't know if anybody was on the board a few years ago, but we did this for a project on Main Street, uh, Center East Commons preliminary plan with no intention to subdivide the property and then followed up with a definitive plan with again, no intention to subdivide the property, but uh, the law allows us to use this to freeze the zoning. And it's, uh, it is a mechanism that developers are able to use so that the rules of the game cannot change partway through the game. And so it gives predictability for developers to understand the zoning bylaw that they will be operating under during their diligence process and during their permitting process. And so that's what, you know, ultimately we, we you may mention solar and say, well, where's the solar array? Where's the battery storage? Where's the stormwater? And I'll say, and I'll say it now and I might say it again later if you bring it up, but that's not what this proposal is. This proposal has nothing to do with solar. And my, my asterisk there is the only thing that it has to do with solar is Obviously, there is a pending application before the Zoning Board of Appeals. The town of Amherst has existing zoning bylaws. They are working towards new solar zoning provisions. And what this does is locks in the existing zoning that's in effect at the time of this preliminary plan filing so that when that, if and when, but I suspect when that new uh, solar zoning bylaw passes, it would not impact this project so that the project and all the, the resources that have been expended to get to this place would not have to be undone, uh, only to be redone. So again, just for clarity, we're not looking to build a residential subdivision here. We'll, we're going through the process. We're gonna talk about, you know, I'm gonna turn it over to Matt and he's gonna talk about the four lots, the, the frontage, he's gonna talk about the area, uh, et cetera but we're not ultimately looking to, to build a, a subdivision. And so I'll pause there. And I don't know if Ms. Brestrup or anybody else has any questions, but I, I think it's important um, to be transparent. All right, thanks, Tom. Chris, anything you wanna say at this point? I don't have anything to say. I think I've said what I need needed to say in the memo that I provided to the planning board. Okay. Uh, Tom, uh, if if Matt wants to say something at this point, I think we should just go ahead into it, and then we can all get into the discussion. Perfect. That so Matt, I'll good. turn it over to you. Great. So for the record, Matt Moyen with Tetra Tech out of Marlboro, Mass. Uh, so on the screen here, just to help orient everyone, this is the proposed preliminary plan for the subdivision. On the left side of the page, which is north, you have Shutesbury Road. At the top of the page is the town line between Amherst and Pelham. And then the very corner here is the town line between Amherst and Shutesbury. The proposed subdivision would be a residential subdivision, four lots, all in excess of 20 acres. Uh, the proposed road, it's 
subdivision road is a cul-de-sac that's 786 feet in length. So it's less than the, the maximum 800 foot length allowed under the regulations. Each lot has 150 plus feet of frontage. Uh, first, from a stormwater management perspective, it's a tip, it's a traditional system that's being shown here. And I will zoom in a bit to get just some of the detail. Uh, we have shown uh, traditional closed network, which is a combination of catch basins and manholes that convey runoff from the subdivision road to a treatment area. In this case, we're showing a stormwater basin in the dashed line here. That could be an infiltration basin, detention basin. There's a number of different options available to us to, to manage the stormwater and comply with the stormwater management standards. For water and sewer, uh, both water and sewer are, are not reasonably available for this development. So we are proposing to have on-site septic systems and on-site private wells. As you can see, based on the size of the lot, you know, 20 plus acres, there is more than adequate space to site both of those uh, pieces of infrastructure in compliance with the Board of Health requirements. So the, the primary thing is you want your well to be a minimum of 100 feet away from your septic system. Uh, we also have adequate space to site the four residential lots and access to them. Uh, that's really a quick overview of what the preliminary plan has. I want to give the board an opportunity to, to ask any specific questions or if cover specific elements of interest. So I'll pause here and more than happy to, to answer any questions that the board may have. All right. Um, board members. Any questions right off the bat? I know I have one, but I uh, figured Bruce would have some. Bruce? Yes, um, given that we know the intent of the applicant is not to proceed with a subdivision, and given that we have a report from the en town engineer that it appears to comply with the, the um, fundamental elements of the constraints of the zoning bylaw, of the subdivision bylaw, um, is there any point in uh, uh, digging into uh, the details of this? Well, I guess I can certainly reference Chris's memo that said we really ought to take it seriously at its face as opposed to, you know, what the stated intention is. Yes, I, I read that too, and I but I didn't understand why. I mean, it, it's it, is is there a if if, uh, if if we're in a position to deny this, if we discover that this uh, that it, uh, um, I um, I well, haven't okay. had to why deal with we something we like this before, Chris... so it seems to be it's, it's difficult for me to 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 get seriously involved in this when I know it's uh, it's not even hypothetical. It's uh, it's an instrument for a, a, a purpose other than to create a subdivision. Okay, Chris? Yeah, I think you should still treat it seriously. You should still review it under the zoning bylaw and the subdivision regulations. And the applicant has asked for a couple of waivers. They've asked for a waiver of the um, requirement to uh, have a plan at a scale of, I think it was one inch equals either 20 or 40 feet, their, their plan is one inch equals 120 feet. They've also asked for waivers from the um, prohibition in the subdivision regulations that says you can't have a, a septic system and um, wells on, uh, on a subdivision. And then later on in the subdivision regs, there is a provision for waivers to be um, granted. Um, so I suggest that you you know, go through go through the memo, see if you have any questions on the memo, and then um, vote on the waivers and vote as to whether you're going to um, accept or approve this preliminary subdivision plan. And I must say that whether you accept the preliminary subdivision plan or not, it doesn't preclude the applicant from um, then proceeding to file a definitive plan within seven months. So really this is an opportunity for you to, you know, look at the plan that's being presented. And if there are things here that are missing or that you don't like, and you would prefer to have them presented differently in the definitive plan, that now is your time uh, mm -hmm. to do that. Um, I'd also note that there's no grading shown on this plan. This is just the existing 
uh, topography. So of course, when the definitive plan is uh, presented, you will want to have um, a grading plan associated with it. So um, I guess that's that's all I have to say, but I, I do think that you need to treat this seriously. Uh, Chris, will, will this interact with the CONCOM at all? No, we're not required right. to so, do that. So this can be finalized without sort of a definitive stormwater solution that meets the any CONCOM issues? Yes, what will happen is if this were to go ahead, you know, if you were to approve the definitive plan and it were to go ahead, each, um, it, it looks like there's no wetland associated with the roadway, although there may be, I think, I guess there is a little stream that uh, goes along Shootsbury Road, so that may be in CONCOM jurisdiction, but if this actually were to go ahead and be um, built, the applicant would need to go to the CONCOM for that crossing of the stream at the beginning of the road, as well as for any development of any of these parcels, they all have, they all appear to have wetland on them in some place. And so if any of the portions of the development came close to those wetlands, um, those would be subject to conservation commission jurisdiction, but there, there isn't a requirement to go to the conservation commission at this time. Okay. Well, I guess I was partly asking because interaction with CONCOM could uh, alter the boundaries of the parcels, no? It's, it's possible that there would be some reason to change it? That could happen, yeah. Okay. But if the, if In which the plan... case they would come back after the definitive subdivision plan with a revised definitive subdivision plan. Well, not necessarily. I've seen cases where the subdivision plan is approved, and if the a roadway is approved with regard to wetlands, then each individual parcel comes before the Conservation Commission when it's time to develop it, and each individual parcel is considered on its own. And then um, the Conservation Commission may decide that one of these parcels isn't developable. And then if that were the case, and the applicant wanted to change the lot line, if the roadway is approved, then the applicant could file an ANR, approval uh -huh. required plan, to change the lot line. Okay. Good. Uh, thank you for that context. Um, I guess I don't see any hands from other board members, at least yet. And so I will ask one question I had related to the stormwater. The proposed drain easement, Matt, uh, is that simply collecting and treating or taking care of stormwater that's on the road? Or does it have anything to do with stormwater that's on the individual parcels? So the, the stormwater basin and the proposed drain easement would be specifically for the purposes of treating the subdivision road. Uh, we okay. would have to look at each individual lot on a case-by-case -case basis as to whether or not additional treatment would be necessary. Uh-huh. Uh, am I right that the grading more or less goes from water runs from left to right down this? Generally, so, yeah. So, so that it's... the actual low point of the overall site is in the upper right corner. Oh, it's in the lower right corner. Okay. Yeah. So generally the site, it's, it's higher on the left side. Flows come down to the south. As you can okay. see a little bit of a finger here, wetland finger and stream running All off right. site. So the roadway that's shown, the subdivision road here, generally runs from Shootsbury Road at a high point into the site where we'd collect all the stormwater and treat it and then discharge it over land like it flows today uh, towards the towards the interior of the site. Okay. All right. Um, Bruce. Um uh, Matt, you may have just kind of answered my question, but let's see, because uh, my question was what fraction of the road uh, would uh, drain, uh, gravity drain into that easement? And if the high point is at Shootsbury Road, if I understood you correctly, so that means that there's no runoff uh, from the road back into the Shootsbury Road. It, it, do we correctly understand that it would or could, once the topography is uh, 
uh, and grading and so forth is established, uh, that it, you would expect that the entire area of that uh, subdivision road would drain into the uh, basin? That's the intent of the design is to have everything come interior to the site as we go move towards a definitive plan and start getting into more of the details of the design. Uh, we'll have to evaluate if that's completely feasible. If in, in the yeah. event there was some runoff headed towards Shrewsbury Road, there are specific requirements we'll need to meet so we won't be able to increase any flows onto the public right away. So if, okay. if for some reason we find this the high point wants to be, say, 150 feet into the site, that first 150 feet going to Shrewsbury Road would have to be treated and, and any peak runoffs would be mitigated. I see. Okay. And, uh, um, oh, go ahead. It's gone. Um, I can't remember my second question. It'll come back to you. I'm sure. Yeah, we'll give you a few minutes to, we'll talk about something else for a while. Um, any other comments from the board at this point? I, I guess I had one other subject I wanted to just touch on um, if no one does, and that is the absence of water and sewer service. And uh, does, do you, does anybody know exactly where the nearest water and sewer service is? Uh, and maybe an inverse way of, of asking the question is, am I correct that all the abutters particularly the residential abutters already have water uh, wells and have septic fields. Uh, none of them are on town services, is that right? That's my understanding that Shootsbury Road does not have water or sewer service in the vicinity of this property. Okay. Which is what led us to proposing or requesting the waiver so we could propose both private wells and on-site septic systems to support uh, right. residential subdivision. Chris, do you have any knowledge about that? There is no water and sewer in the in this vicinity. Um, I do want to say that all of the properties that are along Shootsbury Road were developed as frontage lots, and they weren't um, required to adhere to the subdivision um, regulations with regard to not allowing sewer or septic and a well on the same site. So those those lots did not have to adhere to that particular requirement, which relates to subdivision plans. Just wanted right. to make that clear. All right, so it sounds like I would be most likely correct to conclude that all of those lots along Shootsbury Road are, have a well and have a septic system that they are discharging their waste to. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. All right. So that that for me at least uh, bears on the waiver request for similar treatment. Um, anybody else have any comments in terms of the board? I am going to go to uh, public comment soon, I think. Um, given the number of attendees, I'm sure some of them want to make a comment. Johanna. Thanks. Um, I guess I'll just share my thoughts that I agree with Chris that we should take it seriously. And, you know, if the solar project doesn't move forward for one reason or another, that the zoning that we decide could become the future of this land. And we have a responsibility to do due diligence by that. So um, that's at least the spirit in which I'm approaching this conversation. Um, I don't have any specific questions, but just wanted to share that. All right, thank you. Bruce, you thought of your question. Yes, uh, I mean, I guess I would hope that if this, this land was going to be used, it would be used a little more intensively than this. But I do know it's it's uh, tricky up that way. But my question was, uh, we, I don't I, uh, I, I don't imagine that the fire uh, department have been involved in this. But uh, would we uh, would we imagine that uh, there would be uh, the turning radii and all of that sort of stuff here that would satisfy? Um, fire apparatus to be able to get in and turn around and come back out again. Yes. Yeah, so I, I think Chris uh, 
Chris's memo said that the, the, the radius of the turnaround was adequate for the fire department. Yes, I read that too. I just wanted to be sure because I, I don't think the fire department have actually at this point, I mean, as you say, this is very as preliminary, I guess. So that means that all sorts of uh, pieces of information that one would normally be interested in um, have yet to be, uh, uh, we don't have a, you know, I'm, I'm sure the stormwater calculations and everything haven't been done. So this is a concept that says this uh, drainage basin should work here and it should be big enough and all of that sort of thing. But nothing is, well, nothing is definitive. So um, uh, well, I guess- I, think, I mean, we could certainly highlight the absence of fire department comments, yeah. say. And and uh, you know in our approval uh, include the I don't know Chris if it would be a recommendation or a uh, condition that the definitive plan uh, you know have received some comments or approval from the fire department. Certainly, Matt. Yeah, I was just going to add that, it, yeah, the, the turning radius does comply with the subdivision regulations and that, you know, we've we've offered to, to discuss with the fire chief what his expectations would be. And if a cistern is required, that's something that could be incorporated into the definitive plan. And the cistern would be to provide water for firefighting in the fire vicinity. protection water. Exactly. Okay. All right. Okay, um, well then why don't we go to public comment? Uh, we, as I said, we have, uh, we're, we're up to 22 public attendees. And uh, if any of you would like to make a public comment on this submission, uh, now is a good time for you to raise your hand. Okay, Pam, I see one hand uh, from Michael Lipinski. Let's bring him over. Hi, Michael. Hello. Hi, Mike Lipinski, 167 Shoot Spray Road. I'm going to butter. And um, I'm going to, I'll spare you my comments, but this proposal really brings up a lot of questions and hopefully asking those questions to you, you can ask the applicant and maybe get some, some good answers. Um, I'm more than a little confused by who the applicant really is in this proposal. I see that Coles is written down as the applicant, but yet the people who are speaking seem to be speaking for the solar project. And it even goes to the extent of Shootsbury Solar LLC is actually on the map. Now, I don't know if Shootsbury Solar LLC is the applicant or if Coles is the applicant. This leads to a lot of confusion on my part. Um, that's one question. Who is really submitted in the subdivision plan? The second question is, uh, what does a definitive subdivision plan look like? I, I don't have a lot of experience with this, so I'd be interested in someone describing that. It sounds like that would require a lot of work and a lot, of, a lot more meetings by the planning board to approve that, which seems to me like an awful waste of time for a project that's already been described as it's not real. You know, it's, it's kind of make-believe. We're just doing it to try to hold the zoning in place. Um, more importantly, though, what we're talking about here is two different uses. I'm not sure if the project that Tom described was two different uses or not, but there's already an active submission for an industrial solar facility that's been in the ZBA for a year. Now, a proposal is coming along for a housing subdivision. It seems like there's a real conflict there they're not just trying to use a housing subdivision 
to freeze the zoning on an industrial solar facility. That seems really out of whack to me. And I'm wondering if people can comment on that further. No one seemed to find that there would be some sort of imbalance there. To me, I could understand if it was a housing development under construction right now, and the housing development person was halfway through and they were afraid of the housing development regulations changing. But this is taking an industrial solar facility and trying to freeze the zoning and using housing as the excuse. To me, that doesn't have seem about right. 30 seconds. Sure. Um, the other thing is, I wonder how this subdivision affects the Chapter 61 status of the property. The entire property that we're looking at is under Chapter 61. Does this preliminary subdivision plan kick off the uh, Chapter 61 status? And does it start the process of bringing that out of Chapter 61? And how does that refer to the town's right of first refusal on the land? Okay. And the last thing is, how does this whole process affect the status of the ongoing ZBA hearings? All right. Thank you, Michael. Tom, do you want to respond, comment on any of that at this time? Sure, I'd, I'd be happy to. So uh, number one, the applicant is WD Coles as the landowner, they're also the applicant. Uh, two, and I can appreciate Mr. Lipinski's confusion because it's um, a nuance of the law uh, and, and the way that the law works and it's the, the seminal case is broken stone. And what that case says is it's the land shown on the plan, which, uh, receives that zoning freeze protection. It's, it's not the subdivision, it's the land shown on the plan. So in the future, if the definitive plan was to be approved, the subdivision road does not have to be constructed. The lots do not have to be divided as they've been shown. It is just sufficient to have the land, uh, which is shown on the plan, that's what can avail itself of the, the zoning protection. Um, regardless and, of its of its use correct that is absolutely correct um and then the last piece as it relates to chapter 61 uh the the chapter 61 requires a conversion um so actually doing something different with the land which is not you know that that forestry protection in in so if there is a shovel to go in the ground for any residential industrial commercial use, at that point, there would be a conversion. Uh, but just this planning stage is, is not such a conversion. And I think the last one ha had to do with uh, how does this relate to the pending zoning Board of Appeals application? And I would consider them in two separate paths. Um, you know, I, I do this uh, across the Commonwealth and this is something that many developers avail themselves of when there's a new or anticipated zoning bylaw or uh, the development that they're proposing. And, it, and it's not just solar. It could be, like I said earlier, we did it for some housing on Main Street in, in Amherst. Um, when there is either a contemplated or anticipated zoning change or the time that it's going to take the developer to get through the process and the amount of money that they're going to expend uh, would be more speculative and uncertain if they didn't have this certainty. This this really promotes development in the Commonwealth uh, so that, as I said earlier, the rules can't change partway through the game. So they, they won't have necessarily, just if, if we got the subdivision of Proved, it doesn't impact the solar and, and somewhat vice versa. Okay. Chris, uh, your hand is up. Uh, yeah, Mr. Lipinski asked um, what would a definitive subdivision plan contain? And a definitive subdivision plan would show grading for the roadway. Um, and it would also show a profile of the roadway, of the center line of the roadway. Um, it would probably show um, grading for that drainage basin 
and it would show inverts on all those catch basins and manholes so that we would make sure that they would actually work to convey water into that drainage basin. Um, and there is question, uh, I believe that if this were to go to the definitive phase, um, the applicant would need to meet with the Board of Health to get advice and recommendations on um, septic locations and um, potential well locations. And I know the Board of Health has requirements about both. I don't think those would necessarily need to be shown because the um, parcels would not then be uh, moving towards development as residential parcels, but there may be some recommendations that the Board of Health might have with regard to test pits that might be done to show whether these properties can perk for a septic system. So that's that would be up to the Board of Health to tell us about that. And that's something that we'll have to explore as this project moves towards the definitive subdivision plan phase. There would also be details. There'd be details of catch basins. There'd be details of manholes. There's probably going to be a detail of that drainage basin. There'd be details showing what the thickness of the pavement would be, et cetera. Um, so that's just a general idea of what is contained in a definitive subdivision plan. All right. Uh, Matt. Yeah, Chris, that was that was extremely well said. Um, the the one thing I would add just to, as an education point, so there's this is a two-step process. So there's the preliminary plan that's relatively straightforward to prepare. What you just described is a much more comprehensive effort. So the reason we come to the board with a preliminary plan is to get some recommendations and feedback on our intentions for a definitive plan so that when we leave this process, we're on the same page of which direction we head for a definitive plan before we expend all those resources, doing test pits, preparing roadway grades, pulling details together, doing stormwater reports, all that more involved detailed effort. We wanna make sure we're on the same page with the board <coughs> before we initiate that process. So that's why we're here tonight to, to present this particular plan. All right, Bruce. Um, well, if I'm going to take this seriously, uh, um, and I thought this was really going to happen, I would, I mean, my, the only line of inquiry that I would make, uh, because I think, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, in principle, understand why, uh, the waivers are necessary because without the waivers, uh, uh, it's not going to happen. I, I think I know how far away the sewer is, and I don't think it's on this side of the railway line. Um, so it's clearly uh, going to be a, an on-site systems or or the project isn't going to happen. Um, but uh, if, as I said, if I were to take this seriously, I would probably pursuing the applicant to say, is this the best you can do with this site? Is, 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 can, you, can you not put more housing in here than four lots? Um, if I were taking it seriously, I would uh, like to see that uh, um, it was a little more densely, uh, 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 that the land was used uh, a, a little more imaginatively. If it's not, uh, you might say, well, you know, Bruce, it's, it's only going to have four houses, but we're going to do farming at the top end of it or something like that. Um, uh, but it just seems to me that, uh, and I can understand uh, for the purposes that this is being done, uh, I would probably want to make a fairly perfunctory um, gesture. I wouldn't want to elaborate it. I wouldn't. There wouldn't be any point in gilding a lily. So uh, this is why I w find this hard to take seriously. Because if I were taking it seriously, and if the applicant was taking it seriously, they might w be spending a lot more uh, investigating how this site could be uh, exercised, how the site could be utilized, how the site, you know, what's the highest and best use and how you can maximize value and so forth. But since that's not the point of this, it, it doesn't seem to me to be logical to be pushing the applicant to uh, uh, figure out how they can uh, do a better job or do a, 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 a do a better job of uh, using the site more intensively. 
I don't know whether there's a question there, but that that would be the line <laughs> of inquiry I would make if I were to take this seriously. Uh, okay, I'm going to let Nate speak next. Nate? Yeah, well, me welcome. You showed up late, and I don't know exactly what time. Yeah, I think like 15 minutes ago or so, maybe. So around spin 7 15. Anyways, the, um, but Bruce, we have to take it seriously. I mean, we can't encourage a landowner to do something else, right? So this is, I mean, whether or not there was solar happening on this, they could come in and propose this as a subdivision. And so, you know, this could actually get built, right? So the thought would be for me is, okay, are the, do the waivers make sense? Is the road layout, are lots okay? Grades, everything. And then, you know, if they're, if they have, they, if they actually want to go through with this, they have to come back with a definitive plan. Like, this subdivision is essentially allowed. And so even we don't require only cluster or only open space conservation development, they can do a conventional subdivision. And so we have to respond to it. I, you know, and so, yeah, I mean, this happened the other year when we had a lot of zoning changes, you know, there was like four or five subdivision proposals, but you have to take all of them seriously because they could actually be built, right? So, you know, at some point they have to actually get through and go through a definitive plan, get it all going to get that zoning freeze. And so, you know, do, do the slopes and the grades look okay? Is it reasonable where the road layout is? Is the lots okay? And to me, you know, a preliminary subdivision plan doesn't even need to be filed. It's it's actually a kind of a courtesy to the board and it allows, as Matt said, to understand if there are any concerns and then they come back within a time frame for a definitive. Um, so, you know, I would think about this as, okay, what if they really were going to do just those few lots? You know, are there other, are there actual concerns about you know, the road layout, drainage, other infrastructure questions. Um, you know, yeah, sure, we might want to see something different there, but this is kind of how we have to respond to this application. Well, yes, the, I mean, how it's separate presented to us, it's, it, it makes quite good sense. And if, uh, and we've had some experience with this part of the world with the, uh, with previous uh, uh, more intensive subdivisions that were or uses up here that uh, that that were uh, frustrated to, to a degree by the uh, by the, the 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 nature of the topography and and uh, and and uh, and water and various other things so maybe this is the most intensive use that we can imagine here but uh, as i said if i were to take it seriously so i will i'll ask the applicant uh, can you uh, satisfy my curiosity as to why there's only four lots here and not eight? Or 10 or whatever, more. Tom or Matt? Yeah, yeah so I, go ahead, Tom. I'll, yeah, I'll just, because I'm sure there's an engineering answer to it. I don't even know that we investigated it, to, to be honest with you, Bruce. You know, in order to get the freeze we're really looking for the baseline subdivision that uh would pass muster as a subdivision this probably has maybe one too many lots if we were really pushing it because um maybe even two too many lots because you would only have a lot if the subdivision road provided frontage for that lot so that's really what we're looking to do uh plus quite candidly there's a per lot fee so the more lots you have, the more money you have to pay in an application. And to a certain extent, if you're never intend to build them, why draw more? And then why would Matt go? And I don't want to take food off his plate, but why have Matt do more engineering, et cetera, for, for more lots just to scratch that itch, if you will. So with all due respect, that's why we've done well, what we've done. Well, that's, that's, that's all right back to where I was at the beginning, which is... Uh... So if, if if Nate's concern is that we may actually end up building this, I think I might, uh, uh, Nate, say uh, uh, wh wh why it's really hard for me to take it seriously is because if we did end up uh, with a serious subdivision, the uh, the questions that Tom says have not been asked and answered, uh, uh, the investigation and analysis and and, and various explorations of solution concepts and so forth that he just said haven't been done and he explained why it hasn't been done which we all know why but it would seem to me that if this were heading in that direction as a serious subdivision then uh the applicant would probably seek to uh uh revise the subdivision uh, and and uh, uh so why why am i 
why are we not just happy to say if 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 the if there is a provision in the in the law the state law that allows this to uh, this freezing to happen um why don't we just accept that um make sure that it's a it's a, a functional subdivision which it appears to be um and not pursue uh the, the kind of serious discussion which I just tried to and and ran in didn't run into a brick wall I just ran off a cliff <laughs> I just think uh Bruce that there's this this requires a sort of duality in your thinking one is you half of your brain knows that it's probably not going to happen that it's being done for another purpose and the other half of your brain just needs to look at it and say if this is what they want to do is this allowable and plausible and if there's anything in particular we'd want to see in the definitive plan that's not already uh, clear in the guidelines for creating a definitive plan what would that be and, you know, I mean, the, the main things that have come up in the discussion so far was making sure you've touched base with the fire department and uh, probably touch base with, with the Board of Health. Uh, otherwise, it's, you know, embellishing the drawing to, to make it more real and some details that, that support that, all of which is standard engineering practice and is probably spelled out in the, in the definitive bylaw. So, you know, and as far as should we push further with this, I agree with you, Bruce, there's no real point in doing it. I am perfectly happy if we go straight to a couple of motions to grant the waivers and, you know, wish them well, uh, expecting to see a definitive plan within seven months. Yes, I, um, I agree. I because I mean, I, in looking at this, I I don't see uh, it seems to be functional. Um, it's defensible. Uh, the waivers are obviously uh, uh, you would go to that portion of the law that allows the uh, the, uh, the exercise of the discretion of the permitting authority, which I guess is us. And so far as the scale uh, things, this is a big big site i think uh the the scale drawing that keeps the drawing on one sheet which yeah i know from my experience is a hell of a good idea and then you just simply ask for a detailed plan of this lower area which they would obviously do that gives you the uh the 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 the, the grading and all of the other inverts and stuff that you wanted detail so there's a small portion of this plan that needs to be drawn at uh at a at a, at a higher level of uh, 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 a finer detail so, but that waiver, I think, is not only acceptable; it's it's intelligent and um, appropriate. Desirable. Yeah. Uh, Matt, I see your hand, and then uh, I've seen one public hand come up, so I'm going to call on them after you. I'll be brief. Yeah, and as it relates to the scale, uh, Bruce, that's exactly what we would plan to do for our definitive plan. We'd have this overall view that you see as part of our preliminary plan. And then we would block out at 40 scale the subdivision road itself or, or other, you know, 50 scale if it fits better there. That shows all of the detailed improvements in plan view and then a profile view. So it wouldn't be only the 120 scale drawing for the definitive. It would be that as an overview and then a focus in on the road and the immediate improvements associated with it. Sounds good. Okay, thanks, Matt. Um, Pam, can we bring Sharon Weizenbaum over and let her make a less than three minute public comment? Okay, oh, can another, you... another one has shown up. Hello, okay. Sharon. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Um, 86 Henry Street, Amherst, and I have a farm in Shidsbury down the road from this proposed development. And I would just like to take a moment to call this what it is. First of all, a, a bylaw is there to protect the public from things that might be um, and probably will be really destructive to our town. And this is an effort to bypass the bylaw and bypass the interests of the town. And it, it they're being very 
Tom is being very straightforward that the intention is to lock this in before the bylaw so that it doesn't apply to the solar development. And I think it's just important to say it for the public exactly what's going on, that this is an effort to bypass our interests in favor of this uh, foreign um, industry coming into our town. Um, so that's all, thank you. Okay, thank you, Sharon. Uh, let's bring over Kathleen Bridgewater. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, we can, Kathleen. You have okay. uh, three minutes. Give us your address and your okay, comment. Probably will need one, so that's fine. Um, I just want to point out that the indeed the houses uh, going uh, farther to the east on Shutesbury Road are one house, one lot against the street, whereas the hou the uh, houses there are uh, four of them. Um, that have been built uh, farther up Shutesbury Road, including mine, all were required under the under the planning board to have 150 feet of frontage um, con considered, uh, yeah, I guess that's the easiest way to say it. So for the three that you can see in the picture uh, and for another that exists on the other side of the side of the, uh, driveway that goes through the middle of this um of our subdivision if you will um there each each house was required to have 150 feet of frontage there's mm -hmm. absolutely not that frontage on leading into this subdivision so i think that if you approve it it would become a waiver to what we understood when we bought our land uh, that would be required of building on, on Shutesbury Road if you did not face directly onto the street. So I think that one must be careful about what putting a stamp of approval on something that they can later say, oh, but you said it was okay. Um, you, and you, you, gave a, you gave a waiver uh, that that the other houses uh, that are abutting did not have. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Chris, uh, I guess I'm expecting you to comment on that and about the difference of frontage requirement uh, for a subdivision versus a frontage lot. Well, uh, Ms. Bridgewater is right that the frontage lots were required to have 150 feet of frontage. And the lots that are proposed for this subdivision are um, also required to have 150 feet of frontage on this new subdivision road. But the subdivision road itself is not required to have 150 feet of frontage. It's just required to have enough room to actually allow a roadway in there with the, the appropriate turning radii. So um, pretty much everywhere in town, um, you know, the, the roadways, the subdivision roadways do not have um, the amount of frontage on the main roadway that would be required of a lot on the main roadway. And I can think of my own street, which is Heatherstone Road, which abuts Pelham Road. And the place where the Heatherstone Road meets Pelham Road does not have the um, amount of frontage that a lot in my neighborhood would be required to have, which is 120 feet. So roadways are treated differently from lots. And that's something that, um, you know, people who are, who are in this business understand, but many others don't understand that. So I just wanted to say that the roadway itself does not require 150 feet of frontage. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any more hands from the public or the board. Um, all right, so at the risk of uh, essentially calling the question, I'm going to try to formulate a motion. Uh, Chris, I hope uh, you'll help me with this. Um, 
And I'm going to make it in the affirmative just so that we can depart from there if we need to. Um, that the board approves the waiver to uh, not depict this, uh, this uh, subdivision at one to 40 scale with the exception of the area around the roadway that the board um, approve the uh, request for an exception related to the provision of town services for water and sewer. That the board, I don't know, Chris, either recommend or require that the applicant receive in, input, uh, let's say, receive direction from both the fire department and the Board of Health prior to submitting the definitive subdivision plan. And that with those conditions, we approve this, the preliminary subdivision plan and we close the public hearing. So I think there's five points in there. Uh, Bruce, tell me what I missed. Nothing. Yeah, I was going to remind you to close the public hearing, but God bless you. You sneak it in at the end. I'll second the motion. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I usually forget that, don't I? Um, so, board members, uh, anybody want to change any of those? Okay. Uh, Bruce, thanks for your second. I'll just say for the record, the time is 7.44 in case somebody wants to know that in posterity on the recording. Um, in that case, we can go to a vote. Um, and before I do that, Chris, do you think I do you think I missed anything? <laughs> okay, there's enough in there. Okay, all five points. A uh, vote in favor is a favor of all the conditions, uh, the recommendations, and the approvals, and the closure of the hearing. Bruce, I'll start with you. I approve. All right, thank you. Fred? I approve. All right, Jesse? Aye. Thank you. Johanna? Aye. Okay, Karen? Aye. Okay. All right, thank you, uh, board members, and thank you, Tom and Matt. Mr. Marshall? Yes, ma'am. You did not vote. Oh, well, I didn't need my vote to pass, but no, I'll vote in the affirmative but... too. Thank you, Pam. You're welcome. Thank All you right. very much. Um, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Matt. Appreciate the time, I guess everyone. We'll see you uh, sometime in by by the end of 2025, certainly. Certainly, February, I think, is the date. Okay, sooner than that. All right, good night. Great. Thank you. Have a good one. <clears throat> All right. Um, board members, let's see. Well, let's sneak in the next one before we take a break. Um, time is 746, and the fourth item on our agenda is planning board elections and reorganization. Um, I had expected that our new member, uh, Lawrence Klutz, would be joining us for this topic, and he is not here. Um, he told us he wasn't sure whether he could make it before 8.30, and he might not make it at all. And so I wonder whether we want to delay this, or do we want to just go ahead and talk about this? Uh, how do people feel? Anybody? Anybody? Bruce? Um, I would uh, 
uh, uh, nominate you to continue as chair, and I so, but without actually doing that, but simply uh, expressing the intention, um, would you uh, accept the nomination if uh, so nominated? I'm curious. Uh, in in the sort of hypothetical that you just expressed, I would hypothetically accept. Well, that's helpful. Thank you. Okay. But I agree. I think it would be worth... Uh... I think we should wait and let Larry at least experience our wonderful interaction for, you know, an hour or two before we ask him to vote on this kind of thing. I agree. Uh, Chris, uh, w w can you encourage Larry to watch tonight's meeting, if not a couple of our previous meetings, just so that he has a sense of how... Uh, what a scintillating uh, chair I am and um, how our other officers are diligently doing their work. I certainly will, yep. Okay. Okay, so the time now is 7.48. I think we can move on. And um, why don't we take a five minute break now and then we'll come back and get through our regular topics. So come back at, five of eight, if you can make it back by then. Thank you.
Okay, it looks like all the board members are back. We're still missing one staff member. Fred is uh, not back yet. What's that, Chris? Fred is not back yet. Oh, you're right. I just saw his image. I didn't notice that his body wasn't visible. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. There, there he is. is. Walking in from stage right, I guess. Uh, Chris, do you think we can go ahead without Nate? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, resuming our meeting. The time is 7.56. Uh, next item on the agenda is hold business not reasonably anticipated 48 hours in advance. Chris, do we have any? I don't have any. Uh, do Nate or Pam have any? Nope. Doesn't doesn't look like it. Okay. How about for new business? Similarly unanticipated. New business, no. Okay. Form A A and R subdivision applications. No. We have not. one that is oh sorry, Pam. Did you want to I say, say I was just gonna say we don't have one tonight. We had thought it might be um ready to bring to you tonight, but it hasn't been submitted yet. So, okay, oh, so there's yeah. there's one on its way to us, but we don't have it yet. Mm -hmm. That's right. Correct. All right. How about ZBA applications? I don't have anything new. I don't know if Nate wants to update about Wayfinders project. Sure. <clears throat> yeah, the um, the comprehensive permit from Wayfinders was reviewed by the ZBA last week. They also went before the Conservation Commission uh, for a notice of intent. And the, re the review went really well for both. And so the ZBA actually moved it along pretty quickly. Uh, they're coming back in September uh, on the 19th and 26th. And so those are meetings dedicated just to the hearing for the comprehensive permit. So I'm imagining we'll be pretty far along by the end of September. <clears throat> there weren't many public comments. There was just one in support. It was a neighbor. Uh, the ZBA didn't have many questions. Uh, so if the planning board would like to see the project, I think we had th thought, you know, the um, the later meeting this month or early October would be a good time. So, you know, I think we would, you know, we should we should plan on that. Uh, Chris, do we have much on our agenda at our next meeting? No, no, you don't. Um, Why don't, don't we just go ahead and try to have them come next time? Yes, there is one thing on the agenda, if Pam would remind me of it. It's 422 Amity Street will be continued. That's right. That is a big one. Yeah. But, it is um, big. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you could. Um, well, I mean, do you actually think we'll get through 422 Amity Street next no. time? Mm -mm. Not not in one night, I don't think. So I'm wondering whether we ought to do Wayfinders first. And then however long we want to talk about 422 Amity Street. Have we were um, expecting I think, to, to continue it? I think it we would have continued it to 635 on that we, night. We did. Um, so we made it we first. Did. Yeah. But you, you could also... Um, the next meeting in October is the 16th of October. I think, so, honestly, I think that's a little late. The ZBA might meet again on October 10th. So you want to try to do it on, is it September 18th? It's September 18th. I'm sorry. Did I say Yeah, it's, it's two weeks, two weeks from tonight. Yeah. Yep. yeah. I mean, I think we could have the wayfind, wayfinders come back, right? I mean, it's, you know, if 422 Amity is going to go on for a bit, at some point you could just decide to continue it again and hear yeah. wayfinders. Mm -hmm. um, uh, when it comes, when Wayfinders comes back, this is going to be us just getting information and 
uh, potentially uh, making recommendations to ZBA? Right, yeah. and so yeah, the application is all online. If you go to the ZBA webpage, in the left-hand side, it's, it, I think it's called like the E Street School and Belchertown Road Wayfinders Project, but all their application documents, their plans, uh, their illustrative plan, their waiver requests, everything's uh, available. And so, you know, this would be a chance for the planning board to review it again, just because there were a lot of comments earlier this year when you, um, you know, reviewed the, the the site plan and architectural plans. So, yeah, and they I remember did... a, a lot of comments on the architecture. <clears throat> They did take your comments seriously and they made changes to uh, the plans as a result. Okay. Yeah, I think, you know, the ZBA had questions. There's um, on one site, it's about one space parking space per unit on the Belchertown Road on the E Street. It's about a half space per unit. So they had some questions about that. Uh, they did general site de uh, design and layout parking lighting last time. They didn't have too many questions uh, on the 19th. They're going to look at architecture systems and get into management and leasing. So, um, you know, it'd be a good time for the planning board to look at it. Yeah. So why don't we put it, you know, I mean, I guess nominally at seven o'clock or something, but expect to talk at least an hour about Amity Street, probably an hour and a half. And then, mm -hmm. uh, then we get to Wayfinders from eight to nine or something. Okay. All right. Um, any other ZBA applications we should know about? Not that I know of. No. I haven't got... That's the big one. Okay. While, while we're on ZBA, can anybody describe where ZBA is at with the Shutesbury Road solar application? I can describe that. Um, they really haven't gotten into reviewing the solar application. It was submitted last summer, and they had one um, major presentation about it in August. And then ever since then, it's been um, continued and continued. And we have made progress in one regard, which is that um, the ZBA authorized uh, staff to um, put out RF an RFP and review the RFP responses and hire a third-party reviewer. So we have done that. So we have a third-party reviewer for various topics, but um, there hasn't been a real thorough presentation since last August. The um, And you mean August in 2023? August of 2023. Um, the applicant is on the verge of submitting a notice of intent to the Conservation Commission. Um, they have been, uh, they received comments from the Wetlands Administrator, and in addressing those comments, I guess it's taken them time to address those comments. So they will soon be submitting to the Conservation Commission. So there should be eventually two tracks going along with the ZBA reviewing the same set of plans that the Conservation Commission is reviewing. Um, so it's taking a long time, yes. Okay. Thank you, uh, Johanna. And then Chris, are the is the reason the project hasn't been taken up by the ZBA because the ZBA keeps pushing it or because the applicant isn't ready? I would say it's really more that the applicant isn't ready. Um, it took them until sometime in, so from last fall, it took them until sometime in April to submit um, new plans. Um, and since then, they've been uh, trying to figure out, you know, what to do about the wetlands. And I think finally they've, you know, settled down on what their plan is. Um, and they just haven't submitted the notice of intent yet. So I think it's it's really the applicant. It's not the ZBA that's holding things up. Okay. Upcoming SPP, SUB, SPR applications. But nothing has been submitted. So there are always things out in the, in the wings, but nothing's been submitted. All right. Um, planning board committee and liaison reports. Housing subcommittee, Jesse. 
Yeah, thanks. Um, we met last week, short meeting. We set meeting times for the fall, which will be the fourth Wednesday evenings at seven. If anybody's curious to join us, uh, subject to some changes around holidays, November, December. Hmm. Um, we continue discussing the definition we hope to bring to planning board the next month or two around defining rental houses um, with sensitivity around what's involved in that process. We had discussion about how that may or may not interface with the rental registration form. Uh, hopefully meeting soon to discuss that with staff. Uh, we talked some more about the new state law around accessory dwelling units and basically on the advice of Nate decided to just maybe next time discuss and come up with questions about the law, but wait to see what else shakes out with all the other meetings and people questioning how that's gonna uh, be put into uh, effect and what, what may or may not come out of uh, other others' questions about it or less other towns. Um, and yeah, that was pretty much it. Uh, I had a related question, I guess, for staff, which is about the overlay district proposal that we put forward. Where can we get an update on that? Has that made it to any other agenda yet? We can wait for a staff report. I could uh oh, I could just answer. Yeah, the um I'm working on a memo. I actually hope to have it done this week. Uh and then um you know I yeah, we have to the process has been that we would write a memo to the town manager and then the town manager brings it to council. My understanding is that we the planning board voted to go right to council as a zoning amendment with it. Um, so that might be the route we're taking. Uh, additionally, there's you know been some changes to uh, you know mass general law related to um, how an area a zoning change can take place if it allows you know multifamily and mixed use and other things. And so the overlay actually is probably um, would fit into this category where it only needs a majority vote. Of approval by council to become um, enacted, so it doesn't need a two-thirds majority. And I think the law states that the the sponsoring um, board or the recommendations at the hearing process at some point there has to be a motion uh, that then defines this as you know like an area that is appropriate and meets the the um, the parts of Mass General Law. And so it's kind of up to e each locality. To kind of define some of these things, and so I think that you know when this comes, if this you know this once this moves forward, I think staff has to just confirm with KP Law. But I think this will just need a simple majority, and there'll be some discussion about what that means. And so, um, you know, a lot of communities, you know, might propose zoning amendments actually that would fit this category because it's a little easier instead of a two thirds. That was never the intent, actually. <laughs> it was really just a work on the housing piece. So yeah, there's been some push to get this done. I have a draft memo. I just wanna finish it this week and then send it off for review to staff and it can get forwarded. I guess council has time on their agendas in the next uh, four to six weeks. And so the hope would be to get it in front of them. Uh, there's a few meeting dates kind of um, the where they could get it. I think in September even. Great. That'd be great. Thanks. And, and I'll just finish my thought. And the reason I was asking about it actually was thinking about the 422 Amity and how that may or may not jive with what's some, some of what's in the overlay proposal. Yeah, so, I think the applicant guess, has looked at it. So, you know, I think, you know, staff has said to the applicant, just move forward with their their um, site plan review application. They have a variance from the zoning board. And then if the overlay gets adopted, you know, there could be changes to it. And so the applicant could always come back and amend their site plan or do something different to, you know, to change it. So. You know, I don't, they've asked and, I, you know, depending on the, you know, this could be in hearings for a bit. And so, uh, you know, they could move forward with, 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 you know, their site plan review and then they could get it approved, the site plan review, and then just wait, right? They don't have to act right away. They could see how the discussion of the overlay goes and then decide to come back. So I don't, I think that's what they're going to do is bring the 422 through the site plan review process. Sure. Great. Thanks. Okay. Um. PVPC, Bruce? Uh, nothing to report. Okay. Um, I don't have anything on CPAC. Doug, can I just jump in quickly just for people listening? The 
you know, proposal uh, window open and they're due at the end of the month. So it's an online form through the CPA committee's webpage and the, the portal application portal became uh, available September 1st and it closes at the end of the month. So if people are looking to submit, it's, it's due soon. I, I should also mention, I'm hoping that someone else will be the planning board's representative to CPAC for the coming year. Uh, I would like to give up that uh, hat, let's say. So Larry, if you're watching the recording. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I thought... to, to Doug's point, the CPA committee um, will start meeting in October and they meet almost like every week or every other week and then every week in November and December and they try to finish their recommendations by the end of the year. And so yeah. it's a pretty intense. The fall gets intense. Yeah. But it's a pretty interesting appointment, I think. I mean, yeah, I mean made it's made many generally, applications to them. It's a it's a you learn a lot about what's going on. It's also a feel good more or less, because you're giving away money. And uh obviously you can't give it to everybody, but you you're helping good things happen. All right, uh DRB, Karen. Nothing new. Nothing new. Okay. And Chris, anything from CRC? Yeah, we have um, almost completed our solar bylaw round one. And um, so we're going to be sending that off to staff members, um, the building commissioner, the Department of Public Works, um, Amy Ruzecki and, and Guilford Mooring, the fire department and others um, for review. And then the CRC will make more uh, changes to it, and then um, hopefully submit it to town council to put it through the process. Um, so we're, we feel, Stephanie and I have been working on it with CRC, and we feel pretty good about it. OK. Is there any reason that the planning board might want to see that before it goes to council, or we'll just wait until it, they refer well, it to us? That's a good question. Um, maybe um, you will be seeing it as you know, when it goes to town council, then it gets referred to the planning board and the CRC for public hearing. If you would like to see it before that, um, we can make arrangements to have that happen. We thought it was important to have staff review it first because we're the ones who usually work most closely with the zoning bylaw. I know you do too, but we're like doing it every day. So um, if you would like to have it after staff reviews it, I can, um, I can get it to you. Well, how do people feel about that? Would you want to see it? Uh, I, I think if we're going to see it on the way uh, from the council, after town, from town council. Yes, I, I'm, I'm, I don't need to double do double dip on this one. Okay. All right. Never mind. Anything else on CRC, Chris? Um. No, nothing that concerns zoning. I know they're working on nuisance house bylaw. Maybe that has already passed through and has gone elsewhere. I'm not really sure, but that was certainly one of the last things that they were working on. Okay. All right. Um, time is 8.13 and we're up to the report of chair. I don't think I have any report to make tonight. Chris, report of staff. Yes, we are um, in the process of interviewing people for the planner position, and we've got three candidates that we're going to be interviewing later this week. Um, they're good candidates, and uh, we hope that we can offer the position to one of them. So um, I'm pleased to report that to you. Um, my position has also been advertised um, on Mass Planners Listserv probably on Indeed and other places. Um, we're going to try to get it posted on the APA, American Planners Association, Massachusetts website. Um, and I'm hoping that after I retire that I'll be able to come back part-time and um, work on some things. So that's, that's my report. But at that point, Chris, I'm hoping you won't work on Labor Day. <laughs> It was nice and quiet here on Labor Day, I can think. 
<laughs> I was very surprised to get your emails on Labor Day. Nate. Sure. Yeah, I was going to say, um, Chris only has a meeting, I guess, left with us. And so, um, and then, you know, that staff, there'll be staff changes to the planning board. Uh, but in terms of things that are going on, Dodson and Flinker, you know, is holding um, kind of community events on September 13th and 14th. That's Friday and Saturday. It's in person, um, you know, a walkabout downtown and then things at the high school. Uh, you know, there may be some online uh, supplemental information or, you know, online comments. We're hoping to get that set up soon. The town's also engaged uh, a consultant to uh, update the housing production plan. And they're also going to be doing some outreach in September and October. I think they're planning a big uh, community event on October 1st, and they'll set up an online survey. So that'll be coming out soon. And then with the ADUs, I just wanted to say that staff attended a workshop uh, um, and there's another one, but they're, you know, the, the language in the, in the law uh, leaves a lot for a kind of judgment and kind of legal decision-making in terms of, you know, how this moves forward. And so I think for the housing subcommittee and then the planning board, it could be, you know, what are, are there questions, but on the um, mass APA it was, you know, hosting two workshops and over four, five, over 500 um, people, you know, attended or registered. And there, there are a lot of questions, you know, in terms of even what the definition means, can you have more than one ADU on a property, uh, you know, permitting if there's more than one, non-conforming lots, if you have an existing ADU that doesn't meet the definition. And so it's, it's a lot to sort through. I think it's worth to start looking at. We have to have something in place by February. Uh, um, there's a few parts of our bylaw that are not compliant with it. So we definitely have to change that. And, you know, there's no owner occupancy. Uh, and there's one section where we require a special permit, which may or may not be legitimate. So there are definitely pieces that will need to be updated and we could, you know, we can work on that. And at the same time, there may be some other parts that we have to update in terms of general uh, design guidelines, like massing or architecture. Uh, but yeah, I think there's a lot of questions what, what will happen when, you know, when this actually um, moves forward. So, you know, it might be something we have to kind of update frequently or, you know, get questions to our attorney and then, you know, wait until as long as we can and then move quickly on it. Uh, so, you know, say for instance, if you have an ADU over a thousand square feet, the state law only says 900. So if a community allows one that's bigger than that, <clears throat> you know, some attorneys think that that actually doesn't meet the state definition and that's not actually an ADU that's allowed by right. So a town would have to come up with a second definition of ADU according to the state law. And so maybe the local one is called like your large ADU. And then there's a state allowed ADU, which is allowed by right. So there's some ideas that a property that already has a larger ADU has to allow by right one that meets the state definition. So essentially you'd have two ADUs on a property because the bigger one, you know, is bigger than what the state definition has. And so, you know, questions like that are just, I mean, you know, I, I don't know who's going to really come up with some guidance. The state said they're hoping to, and then, you know, by November. So, uh, you know, the UHLC. So maybe they'll, you know, I expect things to be coming out in the next, you know, four to six weeks. All right. Uh, two hands. Jesse first. Thanks. I was just going to back up to comment on something else you mentioned about Dodson and Blinker. I, I don't know who else saw them out at the farmer's market this past weekend. But they had a big map and they there were just tons of really fun interactive conversations that I overheard and then I was participating in as well. So it seemed like they're really getting a lot of input. Like they had this big map, people were writing on it, comments, all kinds of stuff. And I thought uh, it was a great activity and fun to see a lot of other people getting involved. So hopefully the sessions will be more of that. Great. Bruce. Well, that's good to hear. Um, uh, a question for you, uh, Nate. Uh, you mentioned you were part of a, um, a Zoom call, I guess, with 500 or so uh, people. Um, I'm curious, was there any uh, kind of focus about uh, the the particular impact of this uh, new law on college towns? Because it does seem that the uh, freezing or, or outlawing the requirement for owner occupancy um, has a particular 
potentially adverse effect on towns like Amherst. Was there was that uh, a, a topic of conversation in that uh, 500 gathering, or are we not yet really on the radar with that issue? Yeah, that wasn't asked directly. I know other communities that have a larger seasonal population too are worried about that in terms of you know short term rentals or how these could be managed, but it wasn't asked. I will say that the we could try to find the link. These there's two workshops uh, and they are they were recorded and so. Uh, I don't know if they're posted online yet, but we could send a, a link out to the board. But Bruce, in terms of your question, it hasn't been asked. I know, I know people in Amherst have have been thinking, you know, could this could could Amherst somehow have an exemption, right? Because it really isn't, you know, it's you know every community has to comply with this, and so I think there are probably a number of communities that are wondering what does this mean. Yeah, but you know, it wasn't asked. You know, there really were no exceptions in the in the law. In our um, subcommittee, uh, uh, Jesse, I think it was uh, we we discussed whether we would invite Mindy Dom to, uh, or whether we could talk with her because we were curious about whether it was just an oversight and whether this, as this uh, law perhaps you know gets refined in subsequent sessions, if that's what happens to laws, that 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 would be a route that Amos might uh, choose to take, which is to have the. Uh, have the legislature uh, uh, refine the law a little bit to lessen the uh, consequences on the unintended consequences on on towns like Amherst. Okay, uh, Jesse. Yeah, just to say that I did reach out to Minnie Dom a week ago. Her aide said she'd be happy to join us at some point. I just sent our new schedule, so if she is going to join us, I'll certainly let the rest of the board know in case anyone wants to come to that meeting as well. Okay. Um, I am going to backtrack to one thing Nate uh, uh, briefly mentioned that this was Chris's second to last meeting and that next time will be Chris's last meeting, therefore. Uh, so we should all get our speeches in order to of appreciation for Chris. Uh, if, if not for this meeting, I assume we were all invited to the observation of her departure uh, at the end of the month at town hall. I think, was it the 26th? The 26th, Thursday the 26th at two o'clock. Yeah, so put that on your calendars. All right, if no one has anything else, we are adjourned at 8.23. Thank you. Thank you all, Good and everyone. I'll see you, see you in two weeks. Bye. Bye. Good Bye. night. All right, Pam. Okay, Mr. Marshall. Good have night. A good, have a good night. I'm trying to stop our recording. Yeah. <laughs> Everything gets moved around. Stop recording. Are you sure you want to stop?